friends, my name is Camden Pulliam. I oversee enrollment management here at Midwestern Seminary and I am joined by the Dean of Spurgeon College, Sam Beery. He's one of my best friends and uh, one of the best teachers here, here at the school. We're excited to hear him talk about how we should read the Proverbs. Um, he's done a lot of work in the Proverbs and is, is studying that even right now. So we're excited to hear from him and learn from him. Um, but I, I just want to remind us, there's lots of people who are going to be joining this virtual room. Uh, room. There might be current students uh, joining us, prospective students, or even just guests of the school. So uh, as you think of uh, the Proverbs, as you hear him talk about the Proverbs, we'd love to start getting questions from you even while he's talking. After he's done, we're going to receive those questions and kind of shoot them at him. So I'll, I'll be moderating that. Um, but before we do that, I, I want to just pray for you as you uh, teach us how to, how to study the Proverbs, and then he's going to jump right in. Okay, uh, so let's pray. Father, uh, thank you so much for your word to us. Thank you that it comes in many different forms and, and ways and, and genres. And uh, we look forward to hearing about the Proverbs and to hear from them, from the Proverbs. Uh, we want to live uh, your way in your world. And so we pray that you would uh, give us wisdom and guidance, even from Sam and especially from your word. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, Camden. Uh, yeah, so super honored to, to be able to um, converse with you guys on this book. It has become uh, an extraordinary book and very precious book to me uh, in how I try to live my life and try to be faithful. Um, and I think that it has a lot for us. And it's a little bit of a surprising book. And I hope that for some of you, uh, some pennies drop as you're um, thinking about how you've conceived of the book and then um, how maybe what I proposed to you. And so that was why I was originally interested in it. To be best served, um, you want to keep your Bible open. So if you're, if you're with me, keep your Bible open. Go ahead and turn to the book of, uh, of Proverbs. We're going to be all over the book. And at various points, I want you to flip with me really quickly. Um, but then beyond that, not just having your, your Bible open, I'd love for you to get a piece of paper out or a notebook, or if you're taking notes on your phone or something like that, um, I think that that would be really helpful because each one, what I'm going to end up giving is seven keys to unlocking the book, um, and unlocking the meaning, unlocking the message, that sort of idea. And so I'll repeat those twice, but I really want you to get those. Like that's what I've worked really hard on to try to prepare is like these are seven things to give you. So uh, without further ado, let's, let's just get going here. And I, I will largely be reading this because I want to stay accurate to you and then... Um, within our time as well. So uh, I will look at you in the camera as much as I can, but at the same time, I'll, I'll be reading. So um, Alaska is a nature and stargazer's dreamland. Um, the majesty and fierceness in which God created the earth is on stunning display in Alaska. I've never been actually, uh, sadly, I look forward to it. But if you and I were so gifted by God as to visit the last frontier state, Alaska, we would be well positioned to observe one of the most magnificent natural wonders in all the world called the Northern Lights. You've probably heard of it. That would really be something. I mean, if we could actually do that, I've never seen it, obviously, but I want to. Mallory and I, that's my wife, um, we desperately want to get to Alaska uh, for an unhurried amount of time at some time before, before we die, um, not least of which is for the Northern Lights. But honestly, even more importantly, um, I want to see uh, the stars from Alaska, and I want to be able to just take that in. S some of these will be nerd-level comments here, but there's something called Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. These are constellation of, constellations of stars, and from the Alaskan geographical vantage point, um, I'm told they're, they're nearly unmatched, and so I want to see if that's really true, and I want to see that. Um, the reason that Alaska is a good geographical location from which to stargaze is that the closer you get to the North Pole, the easier it is to observe renowned star, the renowned star known as Polaris. So Polaris is the North Star. When people talk about the North Star currently, that's what they're referring to. Um, and it's the North Star and will remain the North Star for all of our lives, like the duration of our life as, as the world shifts on the axis and those sorts of things. It's going to remain our North Star for the entirety of our life. It wasn't always so, but that, that's the case now. Both the Big Dipper, if you've heard of that, uh, and her sister constellation, the Little Dipper, rotate around this famous star named Polaris. And from the vantage point of Earth, Polaris makes a full loop around the Earth each and, and every day. 
So if you and I could find our way in the skies to seeing Polaris, then we would from that from there situate ourselves to feast our eyes upon the Big Dipper, what's called the Little Dipper, Big Bear, Little Bear, these are constellations. And even in the winter, you can see Orion from, from Alaska. Um, so in Polaris, in nautical or sailing terms, is a load star, what's, what's a guiding star, or maybe you've heard of a, a pole star. But uh, for hundreds of years, sailors would navigate the seas by pinpointing their location and destination by using Polaris, this famous North Star. And it's how one calibrates himself while upon the oceans and seas of our planet. And if one can find his way to Polaris, then odds are high that that sailor can make his way with his vessel safely home. Well, the book of Proverbs is similar in that it has something of a literary lodestar, as it were. Um, God has embedded, uh, he's the divine author, he's embedded in Proverbs one major, one, one chief metaphor or image that guides the meaning of any given passage in Proverbs, any given particular proverb or section, which will address all of those things. Um, it's the image of the two paths. So if I don't say anything else to you, that's it. It's this idea that there's two ways um, and that way is offered to all of us, and with every decision, we're, we're making that. So I call it the two ways motif or the two ways theme, and it's demarcated in the book of Proverbs significantly by the Hebrew word derek, uh, which in English transfers to way or road or path, but it has other accompanying terms that support um, derek, like halak, which means walk, uh, and then there's many other literary stars in this constellation of Proverbs, um, but the main one, the lodestar, the guiding star, is really Derek. It's, it's this idea of there's two ways available to all of us, and it's a metaphor. The two ways theme is the main thing I want to transfer to you today. That is that there is one primary organizing principle that ought to govern your reading of the whole book of Proverbs, that all are faced in life with decisions, and those decisions are like two paths set before him. That is the central image and guiding thrust that forms and gives cohesion and cohesiveness to all of the book of as a whole. So my assignment, is, as you well know, you're signed up, is how should we read the book of Proverbs? And I wanna answer it with, with basically two answers, but uh, developing those with these, uh, this idea of seven different keys to open and unlock the book. But the first answer is this, read Proverbs sequentially or in order, assuming it is a unified composition. Um, the cool Latin term is lectio continua right? You, you read it in sequence. Don't just um, look at one single proverb and isolate it off, is my point. The second answer is always read Proverbs with the North Star image and idea that all of life is a basic offering of two paths, two different paths that are always set before us, two ways. Every decision, every penny, every thought, you are choosing a path and making a life out of yourself, either a righteous, wise path, a blameless path, or a foolish, wicked path. And Proverbs is saying to you with, with every penny, every expenditure, it's your move. Um, what are you gonna do? Which path are you gonna choose? So here's where we're going. I plan to provide these seven different keys for the purpose of unlocking the meaning and message of Proverbs as a whole book. So here's your first key. Read Proverbs sequentially and avoid reading it as randomized topics. Read Proverbs sequentially and avoid reading it as randomized topics. Proverbs, what I mean by that is Proverbs is a context unto itself. Um, and it's really abusable, if you will, by just extrapolating a single proverb. But what I'm encouraging you to do is read it inside of its um, literary ecosystem, which is fully loaded with stand on its own compositional context, just like Ephesians or John or Genesis, any of these books. And we tend to not do that. So it's, it's not random. Um, Proverbs is cohesive, it's purposeful in its structure, so we want to avoid reading the individual Proverbs as randomized topics, or worse, reshuffling them and topicalizing them, which is pretty consistent as well. Um, so all the Proverbs on friendship, all the Proverbs on money, all the Proverbs on marriage, whereas it's actually given to us um, as a context. So you want to read Proverbs from the outside in, read the whole book, understand any individual Proverb inside of the whole structure inside of the whole ecosystem there. Notice patterns and structures that reveal and argue that all of life is presented to us as a series of choices 
that roll up to equaling one of two ways, the path of the righteous, blameless, wise, or the path of the wicked, foolish. But if you topicalize or isolate individual Proverbs, you're unlikely to pick up on the overall message of Proverbs, or at least that's my argument. So let's talk about the macro structure a little bit. Um, and this is where you want to get in your in the book here. So look at uh, chapter 1, verse 1, and it reads, the, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. So we get our author there, but then this is our the signal for our first section, which goes through chapter 9, and it's comprom- com- comprised of uh, 10 different instruction addresses or lectures from Solomon to his son or sons. Sometimes he uses sons, sometimes sons, and he's addressing in in chapters one through nine, friendship, wise counsel, marriage and sexuality, laziness and work ethic, financial entanglements. And it's each one of these addresses, these wisdom instruction addresses, father to son, are are marked off by this, listen, my son. He'll, He'll normally start a new speech, a new address in that way. Now turn over to chapter 10, verse one, and you'll see that these are now entering into the the singular Proverbs that we normally almost isolate and topicalize often. Um, And it's set off by this idea that these two are Solomon's Proverbs in 10.1. And the two ways motif is really demonstrated in these chapters, chapters 10 through 29, really, um, through this antithetical, so thesis and antithesis, uh, they're parallelistic proverbs, so they're paralleling something. So this particular form, in especially chapters uh, 10 through 15, um, forces a contrast between two choices regularly. You're always going to see that. Um, these contrastive proverbs most notably feature and demarcate by the conjunctive vav in Hebrew. So get nerdy with me here. So this conjunctive vav, which is most commonly translated as but. So in your English, you'll see comma, but, and that's showing you the two different ways. Um, There's not always present there, but normally you're seeing one side of the the, uh, road or the other in latter chapters, but especially in 10 through 15, you'll see it. So just the sheer volume of occurrences of this conjunctive vav, this comma, but in chapters 10 through 29, and especially 10 to 15, reinforces the thesis that this is what's being presented to us, namely that there's a choice between two options, two ways in life, almost at any point, and that's called, um, in scholarly terms, antithetical parallelism. Um, There's notably and seemingly intentional an intentional reduction of the vav, uh, conjunctive vav there, in Proverbs chapter 16 on. So it it doesn't disappear, but it gets lessened. Um, So I think he's trying to train us how to read, actually. Uh, the third section that you'll see is um, chapter 22, verse 17, and that is marked off by the term, uh, the words, listen closely, pay attention to the words of the wise. So he's doubling back down. This is still Solomon talking here, but he is showing that there's a little bit of a shift in the sections and the structure in the book. Um, very close to that, chapter 24, 23, it says, these sayings also, in Hebrew, the word gom, which it just means also or added into, um, belong to the wise. So these sayings also belong to the wise. It, it's showing in the editing process this addition to, um, uh, to the former Proverbs in chapters 10 through 22. Uh, fifthly, the fifth section is the men of Hezekiah. So chapter 25, 1, there's a real a strong shift there where we're told that these are, um, well, I'll just read it. These two are Proverbs of Solomon. So these two, the word gom, again, these also are Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of King Hezekiah of Judah copied. So, or, um, or edited, it could be translated that way. The, the point is, these seem to be Proverbs that were left around in, in the kingdom somewhere, probably in the castle uh, of sorts. And then um, these editors, these scribes of, that, that were working with Hezekiah, they gathered them and then they added them as an addendum under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God is guiding this from, from day one all the way on. Um, the sixth section is Proverbs 30, verse 1, and that reads, The words of Agur, son of Jaqeh. And we don't know who he was, okay? Um, we don't even know where he was from. Maybe this is some Proverbs that, Pro- that Solomon picked up in, in uh, visitors that came to him. We don't know. Um, but 
we know that God is fine with putting it in there. And, and there's some really cool things. We don't have time to go into it, but what Agur says, I would encourage you to read, obviously. Uh, the seventh section in the last section is 31, verse 1, and it says, The words of King Lemuel, a pronouncement that his mother taught him. Okay, so we again, we don't know who Lemuel is. Um, never have figured that out, but um, this section seems to be something that Solomon gathered together and the men of Hezekiah probably edited in. So under again, under the inspiration of the Spirit. Um, so there's nothing in the final form, what you could call the final form, all 31 chapters of Proverbs that necessitates an argument for anything other than Solomonic compilation, or, or meaning that somewhat loosely, right? This is material he's responsible for. If you read in Ecclesiastes 12, 9, it says that, uh, that, that Solomon was... Um, he was about the business of arranging these, these Proverbs, right? And that's what we see in, in especially Proverbs 1, 24 through 34, but then even his collection continues on after that. So it does seem to be that Solomon, um, and, and trust me when I tell you as a nerd, uh, I've, I've done as much historical background as I possibly can. There's no manuscript evidence that would say contrary than that Solomon is, is the one. And so we want to take the Bible at its word. Furthermore, if the men of Hezekiah, chapter 25, 1, are the final inspired compilers of Proverbs, or if there is a final compiler at all, whatever that means exactly, that reality only serves to enhance and bolster the plausibility of this two ways idea that I'm encouraging you to read in. Um, it's the central organizing theme uh, by which the whole book coheres. Turn, turn to uh, Proverbs eleven twenty, and I want to give you an example of how this language works and then even the, um, the contrast idea, the antithesis. So Proverbs 11.20 reads, Those of crooked heart are an abomination to the Lord, but those of blameless ways, that's Derek, are his delight. So you have two different ways offered to you, and you even have this way or path idea in this crooked heart scenario, right? So there's our, our ways are chosen in our heart, and we either have a crooked heart or a straight heart, and that has moral implications for it, but it's often visualized in this way, road, path idea. Here's the second, uh, here's the second key. Read Proverbs with the two ways motif always in mind. Read Proverbs with the two ways motif always in mind. Always read Proverbs assuming a contrast is being drawn between two ways in life. The scholarly term, again, is uh, just antithetical parallelism. So definitionally, what do I mean by the two ways? Um, it's the interpretational baseline of Proverbs. It's to advocate that Proverbs implicitly argues, implicitly, that with every decision one makes, one is choosing a way in life. That is, it's impossible to get out of that. To be in life is to be choosing a way. So according to Proverbs, um, this essential contrast, it, it's decisional in nature. We're choosing between two ways, whether or not we fear the Lord. We make that decision. If we fear the Lord, we go a wise, righteous path. If we don't fear the Lord, we're going to go a wicked, foolish path. And we're choosing between two ways um, in the sense of every penny that we spend, so expenditures, every word we say, every, every friend we choose, every sexual choice we make, every rejected or accepted counsel, um, all of those roll up to this idea of our path, our way in life, and we're choosing between two paths, a, a wise, righteous path, or foolish path. Furthermore, uh, much has been made of the idea, if you read on, on Proverbs much, you'll hear about retribution theology uh, in Proverbs, especially from critical scholars. But for me, I think that the two ways motif serves as a means of retribution uh, vibes in the book, right? This is like where this actually comes from, is you start um, setting yourself in concrete the decisions you make in your life. And if you wake up and you're 50 and you've made a lot of foolish decisions, that's not necessarily retribution. That's your way. That's the life you've chosen in many ways. And God can be gracious and kind, but you can't just get out of that. You can't get those years back. So some have spoken of this more as like an act consequence um, feel in the book. Bruce Waltke has referred to it as deed and destiny. So your deeds, your actions become your destiny. You actually uh, concretize that in your life. Um, either way, this Hebrew word Derek and the two ways motif is the act consequence piece as I see it. Um, and you take uh, a road and an action in your life and that produces a certain road. It, it makes you um, 
go a certain way. And by that, I mean whether one fears the Lord tells all the difference as to one's ways and way, and that decision is made in the heart again, and then we go public with it in our decisions. Um, And those decisions all roll up to either be righteous or wicked just to beat that horse some more. Um, So it refers, this idea of like a a wise or righteous person, it's referring to a category of of person. And, And really, they're characterized over and over again in the book. And we we know this. It doesn't have to be retribution theology. Paul talks like this. Galatians 6, 7, it says, don't be deceived. God is not, not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. Because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So he's saying the same thing. This is like uh, this is where Proverbs shines, though, is to say this is a reality in life. You can't just make decisions and those not have implications, right? Uh, the two ways theme in, in Proverbs then totally accounts for and subsumes the feeling of this uh, kind of, it's termed to be mechanistic, like almost God's impersonal and inert, uh, this mechanistic retribution that comes across in the book. The two ways theme fixes that problem, I think. If you read the book in the two ways as Yahweh always kindly, minutely, and intricately attending to the way of the one who fears the Lord. Uh, you can see this in chapter 3, verse 6, a well-known passage, but it says, trust in the Lord in all your ways, and he will make straight your paths, right? So he's watching over, he's brooding over your life. The two ways theme shows up in Proverbs, uh, to, to clarify here, particularly in the word repetition, so road, way, path, street, end, beginning, straight, crooked, feet. Uh, those are all terms that you can notice in English. The characterization of the two different categories of people, so you'll see righteous and wicked or wise and fool, so you're seeing there two different ways. And then thirdly, you can see it in the way the word repetitions are embedded into the macro structure of the book. He's signaling the whole discourse is to be read this way. Here's the third key. Read Proverbs with Jesus in mind as the true Solomonic son. Read Proverbs with Jesus in mind as the true Solomonic son. So what I mean by that is Jesus is the true recipient of Proverbs. Um, Jesus is present, attending to and brooding over those who fear him, Um, often providentially through care and omnipotent watchfulness. So think about Ruth and Boaz in chapter 2, verse 3, right? God gets Ruth to that field, um, and we get our Savior out of that. But this sense of he's the true Solomonic son, he's watching over um, with omnipotent strength our path, um, and he's the true Solomonic son. In many ways, it is his wise ways in the Torah that keeps um, the way of those who fear Yahweh. For the man-fearer, though, so the opposite, uh, even if that is himself, like maybe he fears worships himself, his own desires, the consequences of decisions become baked into life. Our decisions and habits solidify and concretize one's road either to Sheol or to glory with with the Lord. But the gospel news is that with every proverb, you can turn onto the wise road of of Yahweh. You, You have another penny to spend and you can jump on the wise road. You have another conversation to have or wise counsel to reject or not. If With every proverb, you can change. In chapter 9, the end of the first section, as we said, the Solomonic son is uh, presented with two ways signified by two streets that have two ladies inviting to two different meals, right? These two different options. And one offers ev- everlasting splendors and the other offers a meal in the grave. Um, can you imagine it though? Uh, Jesus, at some point, maybe multiple points in his life, um, he's reading or hearing the Proverbs as a clarion call to himself. He's the true Solomonic son. He, at one point or another, understood he was to walk the wise, righteous path for all of us and fulfill all the Proverbs. Jesus, then, is the implied first reader. It doesn't mean he's the first one chronologically, but He's the real recipient. He's the one who's going to walk in the true ways and the wise ways. And just to catalog this, just think about this for a moment. Jesus never once chose the way of folly or wickedness. He never once fell to the sin of laziness. Jesus always used his money wisely and with the Great Commission in mind. He never once chose to dine with Lady Folly, never once. Jesus never once used his kingly power in an abusive way, which we see even these Uh, Israelite kings often did. 
Jesus' father never once looked out of his lattice and observed Jesus stumbling along the path the way headed toward the adulteress's house from chapter 7 in, in Proverbs. Jesus never once objectified prostitutes or fallen women who came to him during his ministry. No, he, to the contrary, he healed them. He spoke to them and treated them as they are, invaluable souls and ones possessing the image of God. He projected for them a different world, a different possibility than they currently lived in. That's how Jesus did. He listened to the wise wisdom of, of Solomon. Jesus always spoke wisely. Chapter 3, verse 4 says Jesus uh, or the Solomonic son is to grow in favor with man and God. And we know that in Luke 2, that is what Jesus does, right? So the son of God is maximally wise. He could not be more wise than he is. Um, there's no more wisdom he could possess out in the universe. It's all his. Um, so the gospel then is, is right on time because he's wise. It's not early. It's not late. Whether that's to you or me or in the first century, he lands right on time and just the same this is what the divine doctor ordered, right? Jesus is what we needed. Yet when he dies in substitute of guilty sinners, our failures on all of these counts are nullified. I mean, he's perfectly wise. His performance is imputed to us, and that's why he's the true Solomonic son. Um, if I can make my way over there, and I don't know if this is a struggle for you, to, to the gospel each day, which, which is a struggle, the gospel seems to me most of the time almost too beautiful to even believe, right? But of course it is true. As Christians, we've come to know that it's true. It's not false. But Jesus, the true Solomonic son, really did reach down and pluck me and pluck you out of darkness when all we've done is return the favor by continuing to question his lordship with our unwise and ill-advised sin. We're rejecting the Proverbs so commonly, but he lives them perfectly. It is just too beautiful. I mean, the too wondrous, the sense of, um, the gospel is too, too good to be taken in because he is good. He is the manifestation of good to us. Um, but he has all the resources to, to treat us with a loveless, or, or to treat us um, in a lovely way, and he's never loveless or unlovable towards us. Here's the fourth key. Read Proverbs Christologically and not as deistic, moralistic wisdom bombs. <laughs> Uh, so read Proverbs Christologically, not as deistic, moralistic wisdom bombs. Um, read Proverbs not as Christless moralism, okay? But rather, read Proverbs keeping the perfect life, perfect death, powerful resurrection, and confirming ascension of Christ in view. A great temptation will be to moralize these sayings that you read, especially chapters 10 to 29. Um, that is, what I mean by moralize is to make them little self-salvation uh, plans minus Christ and faith in Christ. Um, so, to live by the wisdom found in Proverbs is to live by faith, not by moralistic bootstrap Christianity, right? Proverbs can be utterly crushing if met, read moralistically. And I've seen tons of people go this route. I, I mean, I should know. Like, I've been reading this book for years, and I do not live up to it. And so, if we shift into this Christless way of reading it, we're going to always come up short. But... What, what I'm encouraging you to read is that Jesus is the true Solomonic son, so read it Christologically because he fulfills everything. Otherwise, you'll be incredibly discouraged. And it's really a paganistic way to, to read the Bible anyways. So you'll never live up to this standard, um, but Jesus did. The temptation with this moralism reading um, is to read the Proverbs saying as, as a Christless like incantation to ward off bad stuff right? It's just like, oh, that's not good. So I'm just throw a proverb at it in my mind, in my heart, and that will kind of fix it. Let me give you two examples that I've seen people really struggle with. So this is Proverbs 22, 6. It says, start a youth out on his way. And even when he is, grows old, he will not depart from it. So I've seen tons of parents wrestle with this and they think that it's a, it's a promise of sorts, um, but it's not. It's actually still connected to Christianity um, you don't save people. So parents aren't, you know, if they live according to this Proverbs, it, this proverb, it doesn't mean that their child will necessarily be saved, right? Um, it's, it's a proverb. And we need to read it inside this idea of if he goes on a foolish path, then that's what he's doing. That's what he's choosing. Proverbs 13, 24 says, the one who will not use the rod hates his son, but the one who loves him disciplines him diligently. So let's just imagine for a moment if you could rip Christ out of that. Um, that's just the same as saying something like an apple a day keeps the doctor away. You don't need Jesus to 
to understand that like, oh, okay, I need to eat healthy. That's a good thing, right? But these are Christological texts. This is, we need to read this with Christ in mind. So how, is those, how are those passages, if you rip them out of the biblical context or even out of their compositional context, um, how's that any different than that? Well, the answer is it's not. Um, you don't have to be a Christian to understand like, no, I need to teach um, my son to uh, the, the order of consequences in life. But if you infuse that with faith, then that does change things in a lot of ways. So Jesus is the only truly wise son is the point. Just the same as you and I and the Old Testament saints could never fulfill the law, neither can we fulfill the Proverbs and wise sayings. The thunderclap of our failures to keep the commands of God ring in our ears and discombobulate us on the daily. I mean, that, that's for me anyway. So it's the same with the Proverbs. You'll fail daily, uh, hourly. <laughs> on the basis um, uh, of applying these truisms, but Jesus doesn't do that. We, we look to him with hope and with faith. So when individual Proverbs are strip out, stripped out of their context, they are severed off from the intended life of the coherent compositional text leading to Christ as the way of the righteous, the way, the truth, and the life. That's John 14, 6. He's actually announcing, as I understand it, that he's the way. You, you walk by him, in him, through him. Um, they're not topical despite the various topics covered, various subjects. So Proverbs comes preloaded with the assumption that you are indeed walking in the fear of the Lord or you are not, and, and that will be obvious. So all Proverbs lead then to Christ. Maybe it'd be better to say that all Proverbs are in service of and culminate in Christ, but either way, Christ's glorious shadow looms large over and haunts every proverb in, in Proverbs. Key number five, and they go quicker from here, Read Proverbs as ancient Near Eastern wisdom polemics. Read Proverbs as ancient Near Eastern wisdom polemics. So Lady Wisdom, the, this figure, it seems is deployed by Solomon as a counterattack on this, uh, at least literarily speaking, a similar Egyptian feminine wisdom figure known as Ma'at. Okay, so Ma'at. Uh, but really, Ma'at is much more like what we understand as karma, um, so it's this, this impersonal mechanistic concept uh, more so than it is the God of the scriptures, Yahweh. So wisdom, Lady Wisdom is polemical. Um, Stuart Weeks, who is no, uh, co he's no conservative by any means, he, he writes about Ma'at and defines it this way. He says, it's a social and cosmic order which has been perfect since the creation and is maintained by gods, kings, and men, the success of individual in, uh, of the individual indicates his attunement to ma'at, and advice on how to succeed is, in effect, advice on how to behave in accord with ma'at. So notice that um, Solomon actually deploys Lady Wisdom and says she was there before time began, um, uh, and that ma'at is actually beginning at the beginning of, of creation. So Yahweh's destruction of the gods in Egypt uh, in the Exodus story, story, well, Solomon seems to be taking kind of a page out of Moses' playbook here, and he sets Lady Wisdom um, off against, uh, in Proverbs 8 especially, against this wisdom figure of Ma'at and says, she, you know, Lady Wisdom, which I believe is, is, to, is Christ, um, is, is far greater and eternal, right? And indeed, God himself, right? Um, so far superior to this impersonal, inert, mechanistic figure of Ma'at. Key number six, read, read Proverbs as worldview literature. Read Proverbs as worldview literature. So read Proverbs ready at all times to change your view of yourself, the world, and the people in the world. Um, in other words, Proverbs is worldview literature. Proverbs rarely commands us to do this or that thing. Um, if you've ever read it, you, you may notice that. Uh, there's a couple places in chapters 1 through 9 where we're told to listen or hear, but by and large, Proverbs um, is not proposing imperatives to us. Rather, uh, Proverbs most usually calls us to reflect, observe, to notice things, see things, meditate, uh, ultimately to assimilate what we've learned into our decision-making process, um, that we would become wise. So to say that Proverbs is uh, worldview literature is to undergird that it is first decision literature. It's repentance literature. We're, we're supposed to look at the world, we're supposed to look at it from this lens, and then we're supposed to turn. We're supposed to change. We're supposed to get onto the wise road. Uh, turn to chapter 1, verse 2, and all of this can be seen, this worldview literature, that it comes under the 
governing rule of uh, what could be called Solomon's pedagogical agenda, his teaching agenda. And I'm going to read uh, chapter 1, verse 2. It says, for learning, this is his purpose. This is his purpose statement here. For learning wisdom and dis discipline, for understanding insightful sayings, for receiving uh, prudent instruction and in righteousness, justice and integrity, for teaching shrewdness in to the inexperienced, knowledge and discretion to a young man. Let a wise person listen and increase in learning, and let a discerning person obtain guidance. For understanding a proverb or a parable, the why the words of the wise and their riddles. The f and then here's the two contrasts, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. But notice how he uses five different times this repetition of four, or maybe in your translation it's two. Um, but he's just saying, this is why I've written. I have a pedagogical, a, a, a teaching agenda here, and it's set off by the Hebrew preposition of, of a lamed. Um, and it's indicating this purpose appearing as part of a Hebrew infinitive construct. So again, it's decision and repentance literature. The book intends to instruct the youth, and in particular males, um, court officials it seems, so these sons, for the purpose of bringing about wisdom in executing their office. That's, that's the original um, you know, hearer there. Here's the seventh and final key. Read Proverbs with Christ in view as the fulfillment of the Abrahamic, Mosaic, and Davidic covenant. Read Proverbs with Christ in view as the fulfillment of the Abrahamic, Mosaic, and Davidic covenant. Proverbs is delivered and written prior to the fulfillment of the new covenant. That's not uh, controversial at all, right? Uh, just in, in origin, it's Old Testament. Um, but that's prior to our coming Lord, right? So to really understand Proverbs, you need to understand that Solomon is steeped in the literary and sacred textual world of the Pentateuch, that is Genesis to Deuteronomy. And then more than that, even his own, pro his own father's Psalms. Um, he's, he's reading, it seems, these passages, and that's where Proverbs comes from. So let's look at, uh, let's just think about these books that he's reading, his Bible. In Genesis, we see that Adam and Eve once walked with God. The term is actually used there in the cool of the garden, right? Walked with God in his ways in the garden, but chose a sinful path, which severed the holy bond that they had. But then we're told that Enoch, just a couple chapters later, he walked with God. And then that Noah walked with God. They chose different paths, and then Cain chooses a different path, right? And so we're seeing that, and I think Solomon's reflecting on it. In Deuteronomy 28, there's a number of passages here, but just in Deuteronomy 28, we see that we're supposed to choose between the blessings and obedience and the curses and disobedience. There's two different paths that Moses is giving, giving us. In Psalm 1, we're given a choice between two ways, and it, and it quotes, happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked. So there's our character, and then our two ways, right? Happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway, more Derek language there, with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. The wicked are not like this. Here's the alternative. The wicked will not stand up in the judgment, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. Then in Psalm 119, it says, How is a young man to keep his way pure? A young man to keep his way pure by guarding it according to your word. First Kings, Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, over and over again, it says, it touches in with these kings, right? And it says, he walked in the ways of so-and-so, and he walked in the ways of so-and-so, and he walked in the ways of so-and-so. And it's touching base with this book of Proverbs and saying, this was not a godly king. This was a godly king. He feared the Lord and he walked in his ways. But that's all of the kings until we get to Jesus, right? You, you turn over the New Testament page and you see this is the son of David. This is the son of Abraham. And what does he do? He says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. What does the father say at his baptism? This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He's walked in righteous ways. So that's the seventh key. To, to conclude, um, I think we should resist the temptation to read Proverbs as randomized topics. Okay, I hope I've made that clear. Um, it is an image-driven and all the smaller themes and subjects come underneath the singular central symbol 
of the two ways. And the two ways theme is this guiding star, a literary load star that forms the skeletal structure of Proverbs, and it informs the repetition of Derek and all these other Hebrew terms that form this constellation with Derek really being the, the um, Polaris in many ways. And, and you create this metaphorical theological center and thought world that is the meaning and message of the book. So we should read all of Proverbs in that light. Uh, this image and metaphor leads us to Christ as the way. So choose him. Let me pray, and then Camden is going to come back up. Um, Father, I pray that you would lead these students to acknowledge um, not so much the way that critical scholars have understood retribution theology, but that you care and you are brooding over in a very personal, intimate, uh, intricate way those who fear you. And that at any moment in our thoughts, uh, all the choices we make, we are choosing a way. And so I pray that we would repent, that we would turn to, toward you, and we would choose a straight path and not a crooked path in our hearts, and then that that would go public in our decisions. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, Dean Beerick, this was incredible. Uh, right. You covered a lot of ground in a very short time. I'm impressed with you. Was it very short? <laughs> <laughs> well, you did great. I was sweating the whole time. Like, oh, <laughs> people are probably asleep. So we've got we've got time for questions. Great. So this is great. Awesome. Um, my first question, and by the way, go ahead and feel free to, to throw questions at us. Uh, my first question for you was, where did your love for Proverbs come from? Like, how is yeah, that love great. fostered in your heart? Um, so I did... Uh, we're for the church here. Um, I was working my way through writing Sunday school curriculum at the at kind of the first church I was at in Arkansas, and um, I came across Proverbs. I, I think I had worked through Ecclesiastes. We had done a number of New Testament books, done some prophet, prophets, and uh, I started reading through Proverbs, and I was like, dude, I do not immediately understand how Christ is here. Like, mm -hmm. it, was kind of, it was kind of a, this is a code that needs to be cracked. Um, and then the structure of the book, secondly, was like, this is super weird. Mm -hmm. And so then I broke into the to the commentaries, and I was like, wow, this is a wild, wild west. Like, they have no idea. Like, everyone disagrees on this. Um, and so I, I uh, tuck-tailed and ran and basically did, like, just chapters one through nine, which is a lot more uh, simple and clear. Um, the reason people topicalize it is because it's difficult in those later chapters. Um, so I just, I kept pounding at it for years. Um, and, uh, I was, I was, uh, this is very random, but I remember like I had been reading it a ton. This is like 2014, 15, early after you and I had met, I was here and I was like, that's it. That's it. That's the whole structure. Like the whole structure is based on this image and it's not random. Um, you need to just read it in sequence. It has this structure, check the structure. They want it to be, or God wants us to read this, like yeah. it, it, sequentially, instead of just kind of pulling out Proverbs and Apple Day keeps the doctor away and extrapolating that, moralizing it away from Christ. So that was where it came from. And then even just the true Solomonic stuff, uh, true Solomonic son mm -hmm. that I mentioned, um, that has ministered to me over and over again. Like the idea of Solomon looking out from his lattice in chapter seven, and he sees this son moving towards Sheol, you know, mm. and sexual immorality, and just thinking, man, Christ never did that. Yeah. Like, and he's my champion, he's my hero. Um, I can worship him, he's deserving of that. Um, and so I just, yeah, it just developed from there of, mm. of like, once I felt like I could kind of get my arms around it, um, and I had cracked the code, as it were, I, I was like, this book's incredible. Mm. And, and then just, yeah, being dean at the school, youth ministry, you watch students over and over again clip themselves in life. Um, they may have a good heart in it, but they're just foolish. Yeah. <laughs> so they're not thinking about, you spend your money like this at, at, at 18, you're gonna, that's going to affect the way that you do things at 20. Like mm -hmm. that's in, in a short horizon. And they're just often not looking at that and that this is the way God has structured the world. It's, it's with a, a logical, coherent way and that you make decisions that often punch that formula in, and it's going to go this direction. And that's all about whether you fear the Lord or not. If you mm -hmm. honor him, then you go, I'm going to walk by faith. I'm not going to do that. Even though I want to, I'm going to go this direction. Um, anyway. That's so, great. Yeah. One of the things you captured really well in the talk was the multiple ways in which this 
this book, these uh, these chapters really culminate in Christ. Right. And yeah. if you've ever read Kevin Van Hooser's Is There a Meaning in This Text, he yeah. talks about the author, the text, yep. and the reader. Yes. And Christ is the ultimate of all three of them. Yes. He yep. is the ultimate content, he's the right. ultimate reader, and he's the ultimate giver of the right. Proverbs. Yes. yes. So um, I want you to just touch a little bit more on, okay, if someone's preaching the Proverbs. Amen. Let's do yes. it. Okay. How do they do that? If it's not going to be topical, I remember yep. listening to Mark Driscoll do a mm-hmm. topical sermon over it. It was great back 2010, but yep. if they're not going to do topical, how would you recommend they teach and preach the Proverbs? Yeah. So this was the other side of it as well. I started, to your first question, um, I started just noticing, man, Preachers don't know what to do with this. Mm. Like they have no idea, and they just topicalize it. So it's all on friendship, all on money, yeah. so on laziness, uh, work ethic. Um, and I'm just gonna group them together and then you rip them out of their context. Yeah. So I think you should preach sequentially through it. Um, what What is probably easiest, we don't wanna do that though, because we like our three points in a poem <laughs> thing. Um, and I think what you do is, uh, you just let it be what it is. You know, the, you let the literary structure define how you do your sermon. And so if it's difficult, what I've done, I did uh, not that long ago at, at, our, at our church, I did chapter 13 and 14, and I kind of, uh, not moralistic, you know, deistic uh, wisdom bombs, but I was like, these are just, we're just gonna take them. Like, we're just gonna go, we're gonna address it, and then we're gonna move to the next one, and we're gonna address it. And there is a context there. And so I did a chapter each time. Those were probably 40 to 45 minute sermons. So they were a little longer than I wanted. Mm. So if that doesn't work, then do 15 verses. You know, normally in those sections, chapters one through nine is pretty simple. I mean, you can you can manage that. It's not much different than how you would go about a psalm or something. I mean, they're they're not uh, uh, a narrative, but you they have coherence. Are pretty pretty mm. simple. Um, but chapters 10 through 22, especially, and then on through 29, I think you just you just take it as is, and you go, this is what God's given us, you mm-hmm. know? Um, you wouldn't do that with Psalms, right? If you were just preaching through, you wouldn't go, well, I'm just gonna you know, move these around. You're, you would just take them in order, and that's what I think we should do. Um, and uh, it is different, but I, I can tell you the way that we talk about preaching and God's word in our church, no one found that remotely weird. Hmm. <laughs> so they weren't like, why did he do that? It was just like, no, I mean, this is how we do everything. Oh. We walk through Mark this way, and we're just gonna trust that God's given us the structure. And so I just explained at the front, I was like, we're just gonna take it on. This one's about uh, uh, discipline of children. This one's about money. This one's about uh, what it means to be a godly wife. And you just go at it, yeah. you know, and you spend three minutes, two minutes on each one, but it's, it's not... Um, you know, you just take it as is. So. That's good. Yeah, that's good. That's helpful. Okay, so we've got some questions. Great. This is actually following up with what you were just talking about. If the okay. book is to be read sequentially, even yep. in chapters 10 through 31, is it unhelpful when preachers quote a single proverb as a supplemental yes. text for Great another question? Preacher? Great question. So, so yeah, you're right, whoever's asking that, to push back on my thesis a little bit there. So what I think I would say is in every proverb, if you understand the whole context, is embedded the whole context, mm-hmm. right? So, mm-hmm. so normally, so uh, let me give you an example. Um, a woman without discretion is like uh, a pig with a um, gold ring in its snout. So there's no there's no vav uh, conjunctive vav in that. Actually, it's it's actually to me what he's displaying is one side, one unrighteous road that you can choose. So men don't choose this woman. Men don't raise your children to be this way. This your daughters to be this way. Um, sons, you, you know, listen to your father as he tries to help you talk, walk through this. Listen to your mother. Um, so don't choose that path. Uh, so it does have its own coherence. When you say that, it's like, oh, I know what that proverb is about. It's about like not good women. That's what that's about. And you're like, okay, I understand that. But but it's still in light of its context. So it does have its own ecosystem, so to speak. But it just doesn't need to be severed off from it because that's where the moralism comes in. So you're going to, if you just say, hey, a woman without discretion is like uh, a, a, a pig with a gold ring in a snout. She's like, don't, don't marry that woman. Like you need Christ to keep you from that, actually. Mm-hmm. Like he's the way out of that. He's going to train you by his word. He's going to, he puts his spirit in you to get away, you know, to avoid that. Um, and then if, yeah, if you're reading that and you're a woman, right, you're saying, man, I don't want to be that woman. Um, I don't want to go that route. And then it flips as well of like, you don't want to 
marry a guy like that either. I mean, someone who's got flash and that sort of thing, but he's he's just kind of shallow and hollowed out in the end. So that's how I answer that one. So it's a great question. Um, they do stand on their own. I just, I th- and you can see that in the New Testament, James, uh, Romans, they will pull one out. But I think that they're still being, they're not abusing the context. Um, uh, they're still delivering those singular proverbs in light of the whole, mm. um, even if that's not explicitly stated. Yeah, so. it's good. One of the questions that we got, uh, I'll just remind you, uh, points number three, point number seven, read Proverbs with Jesus in mind as the true Solomonic son. Okay. Read, Christ in, read Christ in view as the fulfillment of the Abrahamic Mosaic and David- Davidic covenant. Yeah. One of the questions was, are there more resources on those two that could help our viewers, whether it's commentaries mm. or books that kind of get into that? Because this person said they they feel like they're just scratching the surface with that, but right. it's more help in, in doing okay. it. Okay, can you can you read the the which ones he's asking about or she is? Primarily asking? about Christ. So okay. read Proverbs with Jesus as Solomon's son um, fulfilling the, the covenants here. So I would give you Andrew Steinman as the best commentary out there. Um, There's a little bitty book by um, Craig Bartholomew called Reading the Proverbs with Integrity. That's another really, and that one's actually awesome. It's 24 pages long. It's nothing. Um, uh, The kind of stuff you're only finding if you're just tracking down. (laughs) It was like, I found it a couple years ago. I was like, oh, this is really good. So those are two places I would go. Um, In short, though, there's not a lot out there. Uh, Steinman, I think, gets the book the best, um, and and he understands this two ways idea. There's some other critical scholars who will say that in one one through nine. I don't know of anyone who uses the true Solomonic Son language. If they are, I just haven't come across it yet. Um, So that's that's me trying to say, how how do you locate language in the text with Christ and, and so that's a, as far as I know, I came up with that. Maybe I didn't, who knows. Um, but as far as I know, that's me. Um, and then I think, you know, even some of the things that I said about thinking about Jesus and the way that he lived as walking out the righteous path and road, you really have to just try to understand it. You know, I mean, you, you work with who is Jesus and then what is the expectation of Proverbs, and then you have to do it yourself because there really isn't a lot out there. So I, I have aspirations someday to write um, a book on the how to preach Proverbs, um, and, and that will be largely taken up with Christ stuff uh, of just how do you, yeah, trying to answer the question by delivering what you're looking for. Um, but that's still a couple years out. Probably a couple more kids to be raised before then. But anyway. <laughs> well, I think it's helpful, too, as we yep. think about preaching this isn't the only place where you have Proverbs show up. Jesus himself says there is a way that's easy and, yep. the, and the gate is wide that leads to destruction. Yep. You know, yep. So he's doing yes. the same. You're oh, gonna have he's to learn. totally picking up. In, in Matthew 7 is totally yeah. what he's doing. Yep. I, I, even the two houses. That's right. Uh, that's right. You know, and you, yeah, it's, it's, he's picking up on He even uses nine. wise and folly mm-hmm. language with yep. the two houses. Yep. yep. That's exactly right. Yep. Okay. Well, so, one other, uh, Jonathan Aiken, John Aiken also does some pretty good stuff. He's got a book called... Um, uh, preaching Christ from from Proverbs, I think. So I would look at that one as well. Hmm. Yep. Okay. So this one, I'll, I'll let you take this answer wherever you want to want to go want to go with it. But I'll just read the question. Can you give an example of how you would pray through the proverb, hmm. raise up a child in the way? You should go. Yeah. yeah. With a Christological focus. Hmm. In other words, I understand that we are to read Christologically, but how does this inform the way we pray through the Proverbs and learn to apply them? You guys are asking incredible questions. Mm -hmm. Um, So how you would pray for your child and raise that child, Christologically. Um, Yeah, I think it's to know both sides, right? So you need to, I, I do this, yeah, it's a great question. I'm observing my own children. I have three at this point, six is the oldest. And I'm looking at their path. I'm looking at their way. And I'm, I'm observing this concrete scenario where it's like, if, if they choose this sinful path and I don't impede them on it, it's going to result in, um, in, in devastation in the end, right? So you, you acknowledge that. It's not, it's not necessarily mechanistic, but it is part of the created order. And so you don't pull yourself back from that. You need to acknowledge like, man, if my son is going down a bad path and he's eight years old and it's coming in disrespect and 
disobedience and those sorts of things. And I need to meet him with God's loving, forceful kindness, right, of discipline and those sorts of things because I'm trying to stop him from that path. Um, but then you have the obvious, he's got to walk by faith, right? You're praying that he would understand through discipline. It's like the law. I mean, when you're confronted with the law that you cannot do it, you're praying for that moment to take place with, with that son or with that daughter that they would over and over again recognize their inability to follow Jesus very well, right? Um, that in their flesh, they, they are not going to perform that with, with much benefit to themselves um, unless Christ empowers them to do it. So, yeah, I mean, I, would, I don't know that I would necessarily specify a new way to pray that over your children, what, raise up a child in the way that he should go, um, but rather uh, gather all of what you know theologically from the rest of the Bible and add that to it, right? Of this sense of there, it, there is a normal way in life where if you see your daughter walking in the fear of the Lord when she's 17 and 18, she's crossed over the world, the flesh, and the devil, um, it's likely that that's her path. That's her way. It doesn't mean she's going to be perfect or that she won't have a falling away of sorts or she in, interacts with uh, a particularly unrighteous man that sways her into something, but that it's not a promise. It's just the sense of that's her path. That's what she's you know concretizing in her life as she's choosing to fear the Lord instead and, um, and, and then vice versa, right? So uh, it, it's just kind of saying, have you ever noticed this? Like that, that's the point. Have you ever noticed this? You raise up a child in the way that they should go, they often like stay in it, right? Um, to be clear though, that's also, there's a, there's a lot of confusion on that passage as to how to translate it. Um, it could go a couple different ways how to translate it. So some would say that it's raise up a child in the way that he should go, meaning raise him up intentionally in a way, and, he should, and he's going to stay on that path. Another way that it could be translated, and this tends to be the way that I look at it, is um, the, the two ways ideas. It's actually speaking about uh, when, a, I can't remember the exact wording, but raise a child in his way, and he's going to stay on that way. Like, meaning, whatever you see him doing, he's going to keep doing, right? Which is different than how most parents read it, which is like, oh, i got to raise him up in the way, and then he's going to be a Christian, Right. Um, so I, I tend to think it's actually the opposite. It's, it's just telling you, hey, have you observed this? You saw this guy, he was, he was a punk when he was four, he was a punk when he was eight, he was a punk when he was 18, he was a punk when he was married. Like, have you ever seen that? Like he's saying, have you noticed that? You, he, his way becomes his way. Like mm -hmm. it, it's like his life. Um, so, yeah. That's helpful. Yeah. One, so I, I teach hermeneutics. I'm yep. going to give you the opportunity okay. to disagree with me. Okay. Anyway. All right. Um, do you think it's helpful when we talk about the Proverbs as principles and not promises? Yeah. Especially yeah. when you talk about yeah. money. Um, yep, that's really helpful. Sometimes there's these Proverbs that if we take them very literally, it's like, well, I'm I'm getting rich if I follow this. You yeah. know, so is that a helpful way of talking yeah. about Proverbs? So I, I like to, I don't disagree with the way you said it. Um, I find people want to like rush in to, to fix it with that yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Um, so it's like, they'll go, hey, it's, it's, not, it's not a, it's a principle, it's not a, a truth, um, it's not a law. Yeah. It's like, well, it's, it's pretty close. Like, yeah. I mean, it's uh, off, It's there for a reason. Um, like, yep. Yep. but then again, you have in chapter 28, right, the uh, answer a fool in the way of his folly, um, don't answer a fool in the way of his folly. So that's actually showing you, it, it isn't a promise, it's true. It, it is more of a principle, like sometimes you go this direction, sometimes you go that direction. Like the context will tell you, but that's forcing you back on, you need wisdom. Mm -hmm. Like you need wisdom when to go, this guy is being a punk and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna return foolishness in my talk back to him so he knows how foolish he is versus like, I'm just exiting because this guy is a car wreck waiting to happen yeah. with his life and I don't have any, I'm not going to do anything with this. Yeah. And so um, so I do think it's right to say that they're principles as long as it's like, these are tight. Like, these are like really, this isn't optional principles, I guess I could say. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, your money, if you, if you wisely invest and you do the right thing and you're careful, then normally God's going to be kind and gracious there. Mm. But then again, Ecclesiastes comes in and sweeps the whole thing out. You're like, well, the market crashed, and like I worked for until I was 60 for this. We're like, God controls that. I mean, so I think 
Proverbs is in conversation with Ecclesiastes and Job, mm. and Job was the proverbial man. He mm. did the right things, and he was very godly, and God providentially stepped in and just, you know, knocked his feet out from underneath him. And I think Solomon in, in, in Ecclesiastes shows us, like, hey, um, a lot of things are hevel. They're, they're, they're vain. They're, they're, they're in your hand, and then they're gone. So it's true that the proverb is true. It's true that that's also yep. true. It's, yep. It just, you, you, you want to be careful, I think, to like just pinpoint, like, because um, sometimes really good things happen to people who've been very foolish. And then at other points, rough things happen. You're like, man, couldn't happen to a better guy. Like, that's just yep. rough, you know, and you observe that. So, yeah. That, that's helpful. That's yep. helpful. Our time has, has run out. So yep. I'm kind of curious, what's your last final exhortation for the people watching yeah. when it comes to the Proverbs? Yeah, uh, read it with the uh, two ways <laughs> motif in mind. Um, so just be looking for the offering of two different roads at all points and then um, avoid moralistic stuff. Like always, Jesus is trying to save you from something whenever mm. you're reading this stuff. Mm. Um, and it's normally in your brain. Like he's not, he's not giving you a law. He's saying, have you noticed this? Like, have you recognized that the world works this way? And, and he's trying to stop you. You know, you're, you're coming up to a, a traffic stop and you're about to run out into the road. And he's going, whoa, 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 before you do that, let me just explain something to you. There's a car coming, you know, 60 miles an hour. You want to avoid that. You're like, oh, good, good point. Um, hmm. That's what he's doing in, in the Proverbs. And so it's very much the sanctification and edification side of Christianity um, is, is what's happening in Proverbs. So it's good. Yeah, thank man. you so much. Yeah, man. We've thank you. gleaned a lot from your study yeah. over the past thank many you. years. So yeah. uh, friends, we will be back here uh, one last time with Dr. Charles Smith. I believe it's next week. Um, but if there's anything we can do for you, we would love to field questions even after this. Uh, my name's Camden Pulliam. You can find either of us on the website. We'd love to get emails from you. Yeah help you answer questions about if you're a student here, how you can keep progressing, or if you're not a student here, uh, but think that there might be something here that you can learn more from, we would love to help you do that. So uh, until next time, thanks for joining us.